very much, Dave. First of all, can everyone see my video? Okay, still it sort of stopped in the little outline, so I can't I can't see that I'm sharing anymore. But let me make everyone can still see my slides, right? Yes. Thumbs up. All right. Yes. Um, all right. It's wonderful to be here. Well, actually, not really here, but um, here as much as you can be in these times. Um, hopefully, sometime in the future, I can come and actually visit Toronto and have a have a great time there. But uh, this will have to do for now. Uh, thanks very much for having me. I'm gonna to talk today about our work in equilibrium models. Um, and the, the sort of uh, tacky title of this is that one implicit layer is all you need. It's the trend these days in machine learning to talk about how X is all you need. Um, and, but in this case, we can actually prove uh, that X, that one layer uh, is all you need in fact. So everything else you do with deep learning you can do with, with just one layer. Um, so, so I'll talk about what I mean by that in a second, because that sounds like a, like a bold claim, but I'll try to back it up. Um, but I really should mention that this, this work was, was, was largely due to my two PhD students, uh, Xiao Ji Bai on the left here and Ezra in the center, uh, as well as a collaboration with Vladlin Colton, who's at Intel. And it's really based upon three papers, uh, one of which was in last year's NeurIPS and two of which are upcoming in this year's NeurIPS. Um, all right. So, the way I'm going to introduce this talk is I want to talk a little bit about uh, the story we tell, oops, the story we tell about deep learning. Um, the story we tell at least about deep learning, or at least that I hear a lot, is um, that deep learning does something like build hierarchical models of inputs, right? So, you know, the first layer does things like find edges, uh, the second layer does things like assemblies in the parts, and the third layer, you know, does things like make whole faces, uh, uh, out of these eyes and those stuff like this. Um, and actually I should mention that this, this figure has become so ubiquitous now that you, know, you might not even realize, but it's actually by one of, one of your faculty. So Roger was one of the authors of this paper here. Um, it was also, I have an affinity for these pictures because they were also hung lack at the time was my uh, office mate at grad school. Um, and, uh, and so I saw him like generating these pictures and I see them everywhere now. But obviously it's true. I mean, these pictures are coming out of networks, but I want to at least argue that this is not quite the full story of depth. And it's not quite the story that I think about as being important of depth. So I at least want to present a different perspective on what depth really means in networks and hopefully convince you that there's actually a lot of things you can do with a very different kind of approach and understanding of how deep networks actually work. So in particular, what this talk is going to be about, it's going to be about how we can replace deep networks with a single implicit layer. I'll define what I mean by that. Um, and importantly, this is not like one of those universal approximation theorems. This is talking about this, uh, replacing it with a single layer, but with no increase in parameters. So the actual same exact uh, number of parameters in the layer. And we're calling this model a deep equilibrium model. And I'll define this all uh, more in a second. Um, in the second part, I'm going to talk about how we can scale these models, not just sort of to toy tasks, but actually to sort of very large scale vision problems like megapixel size inputs for semantic segmentation and things like this, and actually get uh, performance that's basically on par with the state of the art uh, with these deep, uh, deep equilibrium models. And finally, um, I want to take uh, the, in the last and the third part of this talk. I'll shift gears a bit and start talking about the theoretical aspects uh, of these things, uh, for which there aren't many things, there isn't much you can say about sort of the, the first form of this networks I'm going to talk about. But we're going to propose a different class of models called monotone deep equilibrium models. Um, and this actually uh, does come with a lot of theoretical guarantees you can make about things like existence and uniqueness of certain fixed points. So that's the basic agenda. So it's going to be these three parts, uh, deep equilibrium models, multi-scale deep equilibrium models for large scale vision tasks, and then monotone operator uh, decks. Uh, I should add that do feel free to ask questions in the chat during this whole time. I have, you know, in, in lecturing, I've gotten pretty good at monitoring chat while I give talks. Um, and the more this can be kind of interactive, the, the better. So if I don't get through all my slides, it's not the end of the world. Or if I rush at the end, it's not the end of the world. I'd much rather sort of answer questions as I go. There is time for questions afterwards as well, but um, feel free to ask questions as we go. I'm happy to break and, and talk about an interesting topic for, for a few minutes. Okay, so with that out of the way, hopefully I've uh, convinced you this is gonna be exciting stuff. Let me start talking about deep equilibrium models. As I said, this is work largely based upon a paper we had last year at NeurIPS um, on, on these sort of the basic model I'm going to talk about here. All right, so to derive this deep equilibrium model, as we call it, I want to start off with kind of a traditional 
deep network here. And so the way we think about traditional deep network, and obviously this is a very, this is sort of a simple feed forward version. There are the current versions, there's also the structure you can embed in these things. But the basic idea we think about it, so you think about this sort of, you know, this, this uh, multi-layer network where the uh, activations at layer uh, I plus one, which we're calling Z I plus one, is something like, you know, a linear function applied to the last layer plus a bias term with a nonlinear operator applied to it, right? This is kind of a canonical multi-layer perceptron that actually has a form like this. And, um, you know, especially if you think there's things like convolutions, you actually can get pretty far. These, these, these linear operators are things like convolutions. You can get pretty far with, with even a simple model like this. And even farther, if you're gonna, you know, uh, add residual connections and stuff like that. And so the first thing we're gonna do to motivate this style of network is I'm actually gonna switch um, to a slightly different style model here, which looks very similar, but has some, some little differences here, which we call a weight tied input injected model. All right, and so this is the same thing basically, but with two differences. So the first difference here is that, um, whereas in this original model, we have a different set of weights we apply at each layer of the network. I'm actually gonna use down the same weights at each layer. And this seems like a big deal, I should say, um, but I will hopefully try to convince you a little bit this is actually not a big deal. Um, not only is it not that big a deal in, in practice, um, uh, sorry, not only that not that big a deal in, in theory, but actually this has become more common in practice too. So a lot of recent networks, um, some, of, some of our work being some of them, so things like trellis networks, but also things like universal transformers or I think Albert was another example. Um, they actually use the same uh, weights at each layer in depth, and basically things work just as, just as well. Uh, there's there's the, you, you don't pay that much of a cost for having a different for having the same set of weights at each layer. Um, the next thing we're going to do though is we're also going to add a in, what we call an input injection, which is the second term here, which basically takes a linear function and, and, and sort of applies the, the or adds the same term to each layer in the network. And this is like kind of like a residual connection as well. Uh, what it's really doing is kind of giving a little bit of a you know the, the input. It's sort of re, um, re by re-injecting the input, it's kind of keeping the input fresh in mind at each sort of stage in the network. Uh, but again, it doesn't seem like a not not too big a constraint. And when you do this, now something interesting has happened here. So with this, with this Foman network, and I'll talk actually a little bit about, so as I said, this is historically a, a pretty common thing. Um, but just from, if you just look at this network now, which is, is actually the form that we're going to use, um, or this and similar forms we're gonna use throughout this talk. Um, what you'll notice is that the function we're applying at each layer in this network is actually the same function. And so this stops looking like kind of traditional network so much and starts looking more like a dynamical system, right? And so what's happening is that, again, you can think of a deep network of this particular form as the repeated application of some function. And in fact, we're gonna stop uh, you know, using the terminology here of, of this particular functional form and just call this F from now on. So this, this function F is a function of you know, the, the one layer's weights and the input, which we re-inject and it gives us the next layer's weights. And I should emphasize that, you know, although I'm using this kind of simple form here for the most part, um, in practice, this thing is more like a cell of a network. So we actually, with this, is, with this becomes like, you know, a residual cell or things like this. Um, and now is sort of the really cool part, which is to say that if we're just taking sort of this, these, these hidden units, we're applying the same function to them over and over then something kind of interesting happens to these, these hidden, this sort of hidden state as you keep iterating this. Um, and what happens is that typically, not always, and actually it could diverge or it could go to zero or whatever, um, but what typically happens is that these models typically converge to an equilibrium point or a fixed point. And this is about just you know, a, a common kind of fixed point iteration process. And for a large class of these things at least, they will converge to an equilibrium point. And what this is, this is the point where, you know, I have some point Z star that when I apply the network layer again to it, nothing happens, it stays the same. So this is in some sense, um, you can think of this as sort of the infinite depth limit of what this kind of network, what this weight tied network is computing. 
And that's this notion of an equilibrium point. And what the DEC model is doing, what the DEC equilibrium model is doing, is we're just going to say, let's try to find this equilibrium point directly. Let's not necessarily iterate the forward process or something just like that. Um, that doesn't always work, or it might be a little bit unstable, or it might just take too long. But instead of kind of just forward iteration, let's just directly try to find this equilibrium point um, using kind of any nonlinear root finding technique. Um, and we're gonna, in, in, in this case, we're gonna use Broyden's method, though actually we've been playing around with some other methods um, since then as well. And really you can use whatever nonlinear root finding method you want to actually solve this thing. And what we're doing therefore, by, by doing that is we are finding this equilibrium point of the infinite depth network. And this becomes what the model computes. And so this is again, uh, again, the sort of the, the basics of what I mean when I talk about this deep equilibrium model. Now, I do want to actually mention now, it's a good time to mention, this is not, this is not actually as, as crazy or new as it might sound. So um, this type of layer is something called an implicit layer. I'll actually get to implicit layers again in a second. Um, it basically means a layer that is that where, where, where you don't necessarily have to specify a, a specific means of computation, but you specify some condition you want, like this equilibrium condition. Um, and these ideas actually have been around for a very long time in, uh, in, in neural networks and deep learning, I guess before it was called deep learning, uh, and a lot of, of related fields. So really, um, these, these, this, this, this idea goes back to recurrent backpropagation. So actually, if you look at this network, it looks a whole lot like a recurrent model where you always have the same input at every time, right? So no normally in recurrent models, you have a different input, you know, it's like a applied to like a, a sequence of words to apply, you know, to a different word each time. This is sort of applying it to the same input always, but it's exactly kind of a recurrent network. And actually, um, as I said, this, the, the, these, these papers from the 80s um, by Almeida and Pineda, um, they actually looked at something very similar and also looked at the continuous time version of these things. And so they, there actually is a lot of sort of history of these methods. Um, actually, some, some folks here did some, some work in 2017 on updating these things. Um, and there's also a, a, a real relationship to neural ODEs here. So, so in some sense, we are like a, I mean, David's saying it's, it's, a, it's similar, but really I, I sort of see this as almost like a discrete time version, whereas neural ODEs are like a continuous time version of a lot of these things. Um, and again, this sort of idea of wait time networks is also very, very common right now. So methods like universal transformers, um, uh, Albert, uh, one of the various BERT variants, as well as some of work, some previous work, which actually led to this from this stuff called trellis networks, they all, they all have similar ideas here. So if anything, this is actually just sort of a slight conceptual shift on some of these things where we're trying to replace an entire network with this sort of single equilibrium point computation. And we're gonna to try to use sort of modern structures and deep networks like residual layers and transformer models, stuff like this as the cell, uh, as our sort of single cell. But other than that, this is actually very reminiscent of a lot of these, of a lot of these um, existing work here. So, okay, so this is our model, um, or you know, rather our, this, this sort of fixed point computation uh, is our model. And now what I wanna talk about is how we actually incorporate a model like this into a deep network, or rather maybe even replace a whole deep network with a single model like this. Um, and so in particular, and, and, and I'm gonna have this figure sort of representing my network now, which is exactly kind of brings to mind, hopefully the kind of the recurrent, uh, the recurrent structure of these, of these networks. So um, when you use a layer like this in a deep network, either as a single layer or as the only layer in the network, then in the forward pass, oh, so let's see, um, can the fixed point depend uh, with the, on the initial weights? Do you mean the initial value Z by that? Do you mean the initial hidden unit? Like what, what Z? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I mean the initial uh, weights on the edges. Oh, you... absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, so the fixed point will definitely depend on all the parameters, right? So, so, so the fixed point will be a function just like a normal network of all the, the weights, the weights, the input injection weights and the bias. Absolutely. In fact, it, it, it's just like a normal, it's like a normal network uh, to a large extent. It just, it, 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 of course, it depends on the weights. Um, you're just going to have, you know, think of it as only trying to compute this fixed point rather than all the intermediate points along the way. Okay, thanks. It definitely has to depend on the on the function. So we couldn't do much training otherwise, or sorry, on the, on the weights, or it wouldn't do much training otherwise. OK, um, that's actually, yeah. Any other clarification points that would be good to make? Does everyone sort of understand like what this model is I'm proposing? Because I, I, I know we kind of went through it a little bit quickly. <laughs> 
Actually, sorry, I, I do have a clarification about the question that Shai asked, which yeah. is, you actually want to guarantee that it depends on the weights. So you can imagine accidentally creating a fixed point situation where it doesn't. That'd be a pretty <laughs> bad fixed Training point. is meaningless. So yes. uh, can, can, can you guarantee that or is that um, kind of a thing that happens in practice. I mean, how can you guarantee that any network's output on the weights, sure. right? It's sort of hard to say. Like maybe you could just like, you know, remove all depends on the input and become some fixed function. Right. Um, but almost, almost always like with a random initialization, it will depend on the weights and then your gradients will point in a way to make it depend on, on the input as well. Yeah, yeah, no, but I mean, there's a distinction between depending on the input and depending on the initialization of the weights. The initialization of the weights. Okay, so, 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 right. So, so what I'm talking about here to be clear is just, I'm talking about sort of for fixed weights, we're going to sort of do this. So, so, so I'm actually not talking at all about sort of training the weights yet. So it'll absolutely depend on the weights themselves, right? But what, 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 what I, but we'll sort of initialize weights as we do with any, with any deep network. You just initialize them randomly. Um, and then what we're going to do now is actually talk about how to compute backprop to adjust those weights in kind of a normal fashion. Um, so it will definitely depend on whatever weights you have. It just sort of happens, pops out naturally. Um, it's very hard to not depend on the weights actually. But then in terms of initial weights versus final weights, I've actually, I'm so far not talking at all about training. I'm just talking about fixed point computation, which is just what you do in a single forward pass, not in the training procedure yet. And someone says, will backprop change the weight of Z star? So, so again, Z star is an equilibrium point for a fixed set of weights. Um, and then we are going to run backprop to change the weights, the parameters of the network, such that, which you know, this will of course also change what predictions it will make, Z, uh, Z star it will make from, from a given input. Um, but that's, again, that's sort of a different thing, right? Like the, the of course the equilibrium point is a function of the input and a function of the network weights, but it's but but backprop is what adjusts the weights, not what adjusts Z star directly. Uh, someone asked about can we remove input injections? That's a, that's actually a great question. I might have to clarify things. So we cannot remove input injection because if you remove input injection, then um, this thing becomes you know just Z star equals f of Z, and then your output Z star does not depend on the input. So that would be a very bad network because it would predict the same thing regardless of what the input is. So because we are explicitly talking about sort of infinite depth limits, you need to have that input injection term in order to make it to ensure that the fixed point actually has any dependence on the input at all. Does that make sense, uh, Guozhong? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I'm just wondering like, if the initial state depend on the input, why like after like 100 uh, iterations, it's suddenly like- it's yeah, not Again, so this is not just 100 iterations, it's literally an infinite number of iterations, right? So in general, if this is actually a, an equilibrium point, right? <clears throat> I mean, it might depend on it, but it's, it's, it's sort of a very unstable one if it does, right? So, so if there is an actual, if, it's, if this function is stable and it converges to a stable point, then, um, which again, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later, why that's the case. Um, then you definitely do not want, if, if you do not have an input dependence, this thing will converge to the same point, no matter what the input is. And sort of okay. a function, a, a property of sort of these kind of stable functions is that they, they, they will come, I mean, I guess you can have like different basins, uh, basins they converge to, but that, that's not what you want. Like you don't want to set up like that. You want this fixed point to fundamentally depend on the input itself. I see. So without it, it, it the input will be only like uh, some initialization and after some iteration. Yeah, you want this to actually have unique, and ideally, which we'll talk about in a second, you want to guarantee uh, that there exists a unique fixed point to this forward iteration. And of course, if that's the case, then you have to have input injection or the fixed point would not, should not depend on the initialization of Z, right? You can initialize Z to be whatever you want. In fact, it doesn't even matter what you initialize Z to because again, we're just using a, a, a root solver for it. So it's just some iterative method. It doesn't even matter how you solve it. Um, you do not want that, you know, the, 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 the fixed point should not depend at all on any notion of initialization of Z. That's like, that, that, that's sort of irrelevant to a certain extent. Okay, I see, thank you. Okay, great questions. Um, all right, so, so let me talk about how, how these things work in practice. So the, the forward pass of these networks 
does just involve computing this equilibrium point. That's what you do in a forward pass. So it's very different from a normal forward pass of a network where you sort of you know, unroll some sort of computation graph. Here, however you want to, you compute some fixed point with some nonlinear root finding technique or something. And then you compute the loss as some function of this. So typically what you do is there's sort of you know, one more linear layer to map the number of classes, you apply cross entropy loss and things like this, but that's sort of kind of beside the point. You just you know, compute somehow the loss as a function of, of this equilibrium point. So now though, I want to actually run back propagation in this network, okay? So I wanna actually compute um, the, 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 the really, you know, multiply uh, the, the, the um, gradient of the loss with respect to my parameters. Here, my parameters theta would be the things like that weight matrix, uh, also the input injection weight matrix, the bias term, et cetera. Um, but it could be actually any parameters of this function f. And we want to de uh, determine the gradient of the loss with respect to those parameters. And so to do that, we can just, we can just apply the chain rule, right? As we do with normal backpropagation, we take this, this, uh, this loss function here, uh, extend out the, the, the derivatives of the chain rule. But what we have here, sort of annoyingly, is we have the derivative of the fixed point with respect to the parameters, right? And it's unclear how we actually compute this thing. Maybe this is actually the question people had before, of like what is the dependence on the fixed point uh, of the, with, with respect to the fixed point of the parameters, right? Because this, this fixed point is sort of a, it's a function of the parameters, of course, but it's an implicit function of the parameters. Um, and this is actually gonna be the key idea of, of this layer, but actually really all sort of implicit layers is how we compute derivatives like this. So um, let me go through this now um, because it, you know, it seems like it might be challenging, but actually it's pretty straightforward. It's a very simple application of implicit differentiation combined with something called the implicit function theorem to guarantee this derivative actually does exist. So here's the basic idea of how we compute the uh, Jacobian with respect to the parameters of the Jacobian of the fixed point with respect to the parameters. So we start off by just writing the fixed point equation. And what I'm gonna write this here as is I'm gonna put z star as a function of my parameters because this is actually, you know, of course it is a function of the parameters. And by the way, theta here could also be uh, x too. We also can differentiate through the layer that way, but I'm just writing it as arbitrary parameters of the, of the function f. Okay, so I take this fixed point equation, which we know holds at the solution. So when we find a solution that will obey this equation, and then I differentiate both sides with respect to theta. Um, now I just use a little bit of uh, the chain rule on this side here to simplify this side. This is this term here is what I'm trying to figure out. I don't know this term here. Um, I'm going to apply the chain rule on this side to sort of simplify it a little bit. So this one expands to the derivative of this function. Uh, now treating z star just as a fixed point um, and treating x as a as a you know also just sorry not a fixed point as a as just, 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 just a number here um, or a vector and X also is vector. And then computing the derivative of this whole thing with respect to theta. Um, this term here is just computed by, a, by any automatic differentiation tool. And then I'm gonna expand this next term which involves this Jacobian here and this, this uh, next term here. And so the point I actually wanna make is that these two terms are just normal uh, gradients that are Jacobians that are sort of computed with normal automatic differentiation. And we can use any library like PyTorch or JAX to compute what those are, or really more appropriately to actually to, to multiply by those things. And the other terms are the things that we don't know. This is what we're trying to solve for. So we're trying to solve for this Jacobian here. And then so all you do is you just rearrange these, these equations um, to find an explicit form uh, for what this Jacobian actually is. And it involves basically, you know, I minus the Jacobian of this function at this optimal point, all inverse times, times this term here. Now, this actually is not really important, the details here. The important point is that with implicit differentiation, we can get an explicit formula for the derivative at this fixed point. And we can do so in a way that does not require us to differentiate through our forward solution procedure. So we don't need to do things like, an, like unroll the forward solution we had. We can just compute the fixed point and then analytically differentiate through that. Now, those that have sort of seen this before, they might notice that there is still you know, uh, an inverse here. So we're solving some linear system. 
And this Jacobian here is, is if you have a lot of, of, if your hidden vector is a very large size, this Jacobian itself is too big to actually compute. Um, and so in practice, we actually also use an iterative, an indirect method or an iterative procedure to solve this particular linear system as well. But that's the basic idea. In the forward pass, we you know, solve a nonlinear root finding technique. In the backward pass, we solve a linear system to find the gradient. And so to sort of summarize it all up, again, the forward pass, oops, um, okay, so now I've built this bit by bit. Uh, in the forward pass, we compute our equilibrium point, we compute a loss with respect to it. And in the backward pass, we compute the gradients directly using the implicit function theorem. And the really important, uh, the, the important point here uh, that I wanna make is that we are not just unrolling the forward computation. We're actually making this, we're actually computing this Jacobian um, uh, directly at the fixed point. And the big benefit that we have from this method, the big reason why this is sort of a nice thing is because what this means is we don't need to store any intermediate products we've computed along the way to actually, in actually computing this fixed point here. So normally in backprop, right? I mean, I know there are other ways of solving this problem too, or fixing this problem or trying to, but normally in backprop, if you don't have a reversible network or sort of a fancy network, um, you have to store all your intermediate iterations uh, at each layer in order to compute back propagation to the network. And here, this is a very nice way of avoiding that entirely because all we're doing is finding the fixed point. And because we can in, uh, differentiate the fixed point analytically, it actually turns out we can, once we've computed the fixed point, we can throw away all intermediate computation and just keep that fixed point and differentiate through it. And that's really the key idea to, to, to this. Um, and as Shai is answering, yes, this becomes now a step in the outer loop SGD. So once we have these derivatives, to be clear, everything is the exact same as a normal network. We have gradients with respect to our parameters that we compute on a small mini batch, and we adjust the weights of our network using SGD or any other fancy atom or whatever you want to do, everything else remains exactly the same. So all that changes here in this network is that the forward pass involves a fixed point computation and the backward pass involves an iterative method to solve a linear system. And the nice thing about this is this works just like a normal network, but we actually have this, you know, um, it, it actually becomes much, much more memory efficient because we don't need to store the computation at any intermediate level. That's the idea. Okay, so um, let me mention a little of a, a few of the results that we have here, um, but I'll get to more into theory in the last section. So the first statement I want to make is that a single layer deck can represent any feed forward deep network. Uh, again, a single layer deck can do this. And it seems like a kind of a like 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 an amazing claim. Well, maybe, maybe not, but it struck me at least the first time. It sort of seemed like a surprising claim, but really is actually a very very almost trivial proof. Um, all you do is and, and, and the full proof is in the paper, but really this is this is all it is. It's it's literally this one sentence. Um, all you do is you take your normal deep network and you take all the intermediate computations and you stack them all together, and you have your single layer be basically the the application of just the next function in the computation graph to that simultaneous vector. Now, that's, to, to be clear, that's actually a very bad way of actually building one of these decks because you would lose all your memory efficiency because you're, and, and it'd be much more computationally intensive. Uh, it'd be basically much worse in every way than just the normal feed forward network. Um, but in theory, this, this actually does work. So you can basically take any deep network um, and in, in sort of stack all the hidden units together to create a single layer deck and an equilibrium point in that deck is equivalent to the converged complete state of the whole network. And I say that sort of just for the theoretical aspect, it's not what's done in practice. And so in some sense, you know, uh, one layer is, is all, this is why we say that one layer is all you need, right? Because you know, you can do anything with one layer. And the second theorem is that actually uh, this is in fact all you need because while it might be tempting to you know, take this great thing that can construct any layer and stack multiple decks together, which would be a cool name for an algorithm like the stacked deck, um, unfortunately it doesn't actually buy you anything because uh, uh, it just sort of says, basically you, you can always embed uh, multiple equilibrium computations within a single equilibrium computation. So in fact, a single layer deck can represent any sort of stacked deck you could create. And so in fact, really it's both necessary and sufficient in some sense to create 
any possible uh, any possible deep model you could have wanted. Um, so, but now is it no longer just sigma of a linear function? Um, right. So to be clear, like the the definitely the, the equilibrium point of the deck would not be sigma of a single linear function. It would be sort of multiple applications of many nonlinearities because you would sort of apply each one iteratively in this deck that you're sort of uh, you, you, you sort of you know apply again and again to find an equilibrium point of. So it is representing you know multiple nonlinearities uh, composed together, not just one nonlinearity. If that's if that's at all unclear, I can I can try to clear that up or, or no no it's unclear it, it's very clear but just the function becomes much more complex yeah exactly well to be clear I mean yes yes you're right it could be like a stacked function still just sort of one layer though in some sense right it's still one layer but it's a very like structured complex single layer yeah uh, like with with some weird shift operator uh, involved in it. Okay, but what this doesn't actually answer, though, is uh, any notion of, you know, does this equilibrium actually exist? Uh, is it unique? And can we actually find it in practice? And for these questions, I'm actually going to return to this uh, at the end of the talk to talk about sort of uh, a subset of decks for which we can prove those things. But for right now, this is largely a heuristic argument to say that empirically we do observe that these things are stable for sort of most classes of models. And my, my claim here would be basically that um, deep networks have been designed to be stable because if a deep network is not stable, uh, it won't work for a hundred layers. And so, you know, after a hundred layers, you're already kind of out of luck. And so in the course of developing deep networks, especially with all these things like normalization and stuff, we have made them very stable. And so they tend to work uh, as sort of having, they tend to in practice, even without guarantees, have these stable fixed points seem to be pretty unique and that they don't uh, depend too much on the initialization. So let's we'll see how this actually works now. Let's, let's talk about a sort of like an application to language modeling. Um, so we're going to apply this to the Wikitext 103, which is a, a reasonable scale uh, language modeling problem. It's not, you know, on the scale of like GPT-3 and things like this, but it's a, you know, a reasonable sized model. Um, and what we find is that if we take uh, a standard kind of state-of-the-art language model, like a transformer, like the transformer XL, which is sort of a, a nice transformer-based uh, language model, and create a DEC version of this. So we basically take the transformer cell and treat that as our function f, and then find a fixed point of this sort of iterated uh, transformer block that we apply in a weight-tied fashion again and again. But of course, we're, we're really just finding a root to it. Um, what we find is that sort of across the board, the DEC for a similar number of parameters, the DEC model performs better than the, the standard transformer XL and uses much less memory. So it's sort of a win on both, uh, on both counts. Um, so for how difficult is it to commit the fixed point on this? Yeah, the, and I think there's actually Two good questions they're related so in practice this is not very hard to compute them we need about um i'll talk about sort of iteration counts in a second we typically iterate these for about we, we iterate not fixed point iteration but we iterate broiden's method for about um uh 25 iterations or so and then we get pretty close to the to the to the, the fixed point i'm actually not going to talk about this but you don't have to be right at the fixed point this is, uh, like this, this is actually a, a, an important an important point you, you'll need to find it exactly you can get kind of close enough and it works pretty well in practice though exactly why that works is still a kind of an open question um but it's not very unstable no um the instability is also while training that calls me instability in like the the updates to the weights themselves um but no we don't observe those however we use a lot of the same tricks transformers use to, to stabilize themselves so you know we're definitely exploiting the advances that have been made by normal deep learning for this okay so so the, the, the point here is that kind of across the board we both noticed that um our the the deck variant of mo of all these standard models with the same number of parameters takes less memory and performs better than the traditional feed forward variant. So for a small transformer, this is true. For a model that we had developed called the trellis net, this is also true. It's kind of like a cross between an LSTM and a, and a convolutional network. Um, and even for larger transformers, this is also true. Uh, oh, I should mention that, you know, if you keep going here, we haven't run them that much farther than this just because we don't have quite, I guess we, we, we're starting to have them now, but, but at the time here, we, we didn't have enough compute to do this. Um, but th th there certainly are models that do much better than this level that I just want to highlight here that there are better, you know, extra large 
uh, transformer models that we have not yet created deck variants of just due to compute constraints. But this pattern does seem to hold kind of across the board that for the same model at the same number of parameters, you get slightly better performance with less memory consumption for the for the deck. Okay. So I guess this is this is a pretty rosy story right now. So you know they they work better, less memory. Why would anyone not use these things? Um, which is a great, great question. Maybe everyone should use them. But there also are some notable disadvantages here. So um, the, the first thing I want to be very sort of upfront about is that these things are slower than traditional networks. They're not hugely slower, but you typically need more calls. To the, even in a nonlinear root finding method like Broyden's method, uh, you need more calls to the function to compute a fixed point than there are traditional layers in most practical deep networks. And so what this means in practice is that you need about two to three times uh, as long to train these things, and maybe about one, one and a half to two times as long uh, to run them uh, for in, in the inference phase. Uh, and so this is, this is actually, I would say, sort of the, the, the main uh, downside to DEX right now that, that, that we are working on solving, we're working on improving this, but this is still a problem. Uh, they are slower than the traditional uh, and the, the analogous purely feed forward uh, variants of these networks. Um, as I say, we're improving that. Uh, I won't talk too much about that one because that one's sort of on, very much ongoing work. Um, but I will talk about two other deficiencies that DEX, that DEX have that I think we can start to address. Um, so, so someone mentioned if F is very complicated, like, then taking the inverse is quite expensive. So to be clear, we're taking the inverse. We're, I mean, A, we're not really taking the inverse. And we're not taking the inverse of F. We're taking the inverse of the Jacobian F, which is a linear system. So we're, we're, we're solving a linear system still in this, in this thing, not the inverse of F. So, so this does not involve the actual inverse of F here. It involves the inverse of the Jacobian, which is just a matrix. Okay, so it's a linear solve that we're doing. And that's actually not any more complicated for a transformer than anything else. It's still just, I mean, it's just backprop basically. I guess it's a little bit more uh, complicated, but, but, but not much more. Um, so so uh, it's, it's not because of the complexity of F, it's just because, I mean, if it's big, it's big, uh, but that's not, the main, that's not the main driver of it. Um, however, there are some other problems I think we can address. So the first problem is that, um, one layer is great, but one layer seems to become inherently kind of single scale, right? Whereas modern deep networks, they sort of serve two properties of depth. On the one hand, it sort of adds nonlinearity, adds complexity to the function, but it also allows for sort of multi-scale processing, right? So later layers have, you know, more compressed feature maps and, or, or, you know, um, more reduced feature maps and stuff like that to sort, of, to sort of model these things. And that seems to be actually an inherent kind of modeling benefit of these methods. The second is that we can't really say much about uh, the, the existence and uniqueness of this fixed point. So, so also mentioned we're inverting Jacob matrix, right? So we're not actually going to invert that matrix. We're going to solve that linear system with an iterative method that will also use about 25 iterations or so. Uh, we don't actually ever form the inverse. That would be too small, too slow. I mean, just it's, it's, you can't even store, can't even form that inverse, let alone or that, that Jacobian, let alone invert it. So we're going to use a, an iterative method to actually solve that as well. OK, so let me address these two things now about how we uh, deal with multi-scale systems and how we can, in some cases, prove existence, uniqueness, et cetera, of, of, of these fixed points. All right, so this first bit is going to be about multi-scale decks, which is a uh, paper that's coming out in this year's NeurIPS. And the basic idea is that images themselves are sort of inherently hierarchical, right? And it seems like if we're going to apply a deck to these things, a single layer, we still sort of want there to be a way to analyze the image at different spatial scales. That seems really important to sort of the model here. And secondly, images are large, right? And if we have, if, if, you know, if our single function was like a convolution, um, this would actually take a very long time to mix the influence of this single layer across the whole image, right? If you have a three by three convolution, it's going to take a whole lot of function applications to actually share, um, you know, uh, influence of this function across across the whole image. Um, and of course, you can't even store the intermediate Jacobians that you need for Broyden's method there. That's typically, that's not the full Jacobian, it's a different Jacobian that Broyden is updating in low rank, but even that's actually hard to do. So the idea that we're going to do is we're going to use a method called the multi-scale deck, which is going to address some of these issues. And the idea is actually very simple. Um, we're going to maintain in the hidden unit multiple spatial scales of, uh, of the image, of features uh, for the image, and we're going to simultaneously find an equilibrium point for all of them. So what that looks like is we have our input image. 
we maintain several different um, hidden, hidden units or features of this image. Um, and we're going to, and our function is going to reply, uh, first of all, a residual block to all of these things. And then we're going to importantly mix them all together by upsampling and downsampling. So we have sort of, you know, our sing, and we're going to call this whole thing here f. So our single function f now actually provides mixing between all the spatial scales and allows for influence from very far parts of the image to kind of quickly mix together, as well as maintain separate features at each different scale for this image, for the high resolution as well as low resolution. We're going to find an equilibrium jointly in all of this, and then we're going to apply a loss function uh, based upon our task. And the really nice thing about this model is that because it's doing this simultaneously, because it's sort of creating a high resolution set of features and a low resolution set of features, is that we can use the exact same model here for different end, uh, for different end tasks. For example, if we want to do segmentation, we can apply a segmentation loss directly to the high sort of high resolution uh, spatial scale of this of these features. Or if we want to apply a classification loss, we can directly apply this to the low resolution features of this of this uh, model. And in fact, the results I'm going to show coming up use in fact the exact same model for both classification on ImageNet and semantic segmentation on cityscapes. The only difference is what loss we apply at what special at what spatial scale here. So it's really nice that we, you know, we don't need to worry about like having things like backbones like a lot of segmentation models have and stuff like this. We just use one single model for all these different classes of problems here. Also getting a little detailed now, we actually have to use a limited memory Broid method because there isn't even enough memory to store sort of the, the intermediate terms here because the hidden units are, are quite large, but that's sort of a, a kind of a, an, an algorithmic thing that we change. Um, for the, do you feed downsampled X? Uh, no, so we just, we tried this actually. We also, we also tried, you know, taking a downsampled input of X and feeding that into these ones. It doesn't change anything at all. Um, and it actually makes it work a little bit worse. Um, so basically we just give it, because there's downsampling here, you know, these things can learn uh, from a few layers. And of course the equilibrium point, they'll all depend on each other, right? So, so we don't need to actually downsample and feed that directly into these ones. Um, so what's the mixing operation across scales? So the downsampling is done with strided convolution and the upsampling is done with bilinear interpolation. Just the sort of the simple things you'd want to do. Okay, so how does this work? Um, so first of all, on a simple task like CIFAR, uh, where we don't really need these multiple scales maybe, but it, it works pretty well. Um, so compared to some other sort of, uh, uh, um, I know neural these are not meant for this, but we'll try to apply them to, to CIFAR anyway. <laughs> um, and all these th things, you know, it's actually quite hard to use to work kind of, kind of well, um, at least as far as we know, maybe David has some better ways of doing this, but, um, uh, basically, neural ODE sort of do do you know they they, they they do okay on smaller scale models, but but not great in terms of accuracy as far as CIFAR goes. You know, a ResNet can can do better than that. Um, but at least for a very small number of parameters, you know, both a single stream deck, but then more importantly, our multi scale uh, deck does quite a bit better than sort of other methods, the uh, other implicit methods or other ResNet models even with the same number of parameters. And just to be clear, you know, 87% is not good performance for CIFAR. So, you know, if we apply all the, you know, regular tricks, even this is not that big of a, of a model here. And without that many tricks, we of course get, you know, the, the normal kind of 94% accuracy. This could be bumped up quite a bit more if you really want to also. Um, but when you include the implementation, you know, that, that, that does sort of fine for, these, for this uh, size problem. But maybe more importantly is what actually does on, on sort of large scale image, uh, image problems. So more importantly on, on ImageNet, so look at top one accuracy on ImageNet, um, what you find is that the methods are you know, competitive, not, not state of the art by any means, but competitive given sort of similar training procedures as kind of classical methods like uh, ResNets, like um, uh, HRNets, which is another kind of recent multi-scale imaging approach, uh, dense nets, et cetera. And so, you know, again, we're not quite uh, state of the art here, but with a reasonable size model, not too big, we can get, you know, around 80% accuracy, top one accuracy on ImageNet uh, with a similar training, a similar training regime as these other models. And then maybe sort of most interestingly is that 
with this exact same model. So again, the model remains the same. All it changes is the loss function. With this exact same model, it's a different loss function. We actually can also apply this same model to semantic segmentation in cityscapes and get pretty good performance there too. So again, for sort of similar size models, we actually are quite competitive uh, for small models in terms of like the, the, the um, uh, M, uh, MIOU uh, performance metric, the mean intersection of reunion. Um, and it's the similar sort of situation holds when we talk about uh, uh, big models as well. And in fact, in this case, um, this, this column here is the actual state of the art on, on, uh, on cityscapes uh, for semantic segmentation. And we are sort of second uh, on most of these most of these metrics and outperform kind of standard models like Deep Lab or PSPNet or a UNet and things like this. So this is uh, the, the, the cool thing I want to highlight here is this is you know, an implicit layer. And to the best of my knowledge, sort of the, the first time an implicit layer has been competitive on these large scale vision tasks. Um, as opposed to sort of very different classes of problems where they're usually applied uh, than, than, and, and not usually competitive on, on these problems with kind of traditional feed forward, large scale convolutional networks. And just because, you know, I've shown nothing but plots so far and I might, you know, I've done cityscapes, so I might as well at least show you one video. Here's a video of us uh, segmenting cityscapes um, at, on, on, on full resolution here. So, uh, Take first what you will. I mean, I don't know how to read too much into this other than this is pretty good. Uh, this is what 80 MIOU looks like on cityscapes, I guess. It gets some things wrong sometimes, but the things it gets wrong are even as like, is this, you know, uh, a building or a board or like a billboard and stuff like that. The actual cars themselves as well as the road and like, uh, you know, the, the, the scene and everything like that and the buildings, those are, those are done very, very well with this model. So I'll pause it here. I'm gonna flush the whole thing. Uh, so, you know, pedestrians outlined pretty nicely, cars, other pedestrians, or bicyclists there, pedestrians there, they're all, they're all outlined pretty, pretty far. Um, I'll, I'll actually maybe, so, so, so to what extent, okay, so there's a lot of questions now. To what extent is it special vision tasks? So, so in general, this is definitely not special to it. I mean, we just talked about NLP tasks before, right? This notion of sort of the equilibrium model as a whole are very generic. The multi-scale version is an image sort of specialized uh, task, right? That's trying to design for imaging. We haven't really thought about too much of that if you do something similar for language. Maybe you could, but it's not really the point. The point is for that multi-scale model to, to handle images. Um, any intuitions why um, the achieve better competitive performance? Um, maybe I'll address that afterwards. I mean, not really other than the fact that depth is a good thing and infinite depth is a better thing, right? It does, I mean, there's a limit to it, right? But if you're gonna have a model of a certain size, you, you might as well find the infinite depth limit uh, of this model. Um, you typically, actually, I'm not gonna show it here, but we have an experiment where with a fixed model, the closer and closer you get to a natural equilibrium point, the better and better performance gets. So there is some notion in which just repeatedly applying in some sense this nonlinearity is a beneficial thing um, obviously, it's just diminishing returns at some point, but it's beneficial to be deeper, even if you have the same weights. And so that's, that's I think, the intuition there. That's at least my intuition about why it works. Um, in terms of the channels, uh, yeah, so the, the channels certainly are large, but they aren't that large. They're like, um, <clears throat> I'm going to get the order, of, I'm, I'm going to get the, the exact size wrong here. So that they're, they're a little bit bigger than the standard ones, just because you have to sort of equalize the number of parameters, but they aren't that much bigger. They're, they're you know, like square root depth bigger because that's sort of the, the will be the scaling law there. So they're, they're a little bit bigger than most models, but ultimately the memory is still actually still uh, cheaper to do a deck than, than these big models. Okay, so again, sort of, oops, start over again. So again, the key insights are that these are competitive with the state of the art uh, using the same model in both settings. Um, and I generally think this sort of shows that a lot of these things, th th these implicit models really can work, not just on toy problems, but on kind of the, the large scale competitive vision problems that deep learning has kind of made its name with. Uh, and so this is, I think, a, a really nice step forward for these models. All right. So in the last bit of time I have left, I do want to mention a little bit about this last class of, of, uh, of DEX, which start to address some of these questions about existence and uniqueness of fixed points, which so far has been entirely kind of heuristic in nature. So 
the basic question that we have here is that what can, even if I have a very simple model like this, you know, a single nonlinearity uh, applied to a matrix or like a convolutional operator or whatever, uh, plus some input injection, can I say anything formal about whether or not this will have a fixed point? It's actually, I mean, I, sometimes I can do this. I can say that, you know, if I can call it like contractive, I can use sort of, you know, generic things, just, just like, the, like, you know, the um, Brouwer's theorem and stuff like this to say like that maybe it's contractive and it will have a fixed point there, but is it gonna be unique? It's sort of, sort of unclear how, how you say things like that, right? And so um, this is a nonlinear system. And in general, nonlinear systems, it's hard to say much about them, right? We, you know, if these are nonlinear systems, they could have no fixed points, it could have many fixed points, it could have uh, sort of one fixed point, anything is possible. Um, and so it's difficult to establish, because we're just sort of not talking about an iteration here, we're talking about the generic existence of a fixed point, it's hard to sort of say for sure whether this will have a fixed point or not. This is actually different from things like ODEs, uh, and this is actually, you know, I, I think one of the advantages of neural ODEs, this, you know, prior to this sort of this other class of decks, is that you can guarantee existence and uniqueness at least uh, locally uh, around the trajectory because of things like Picard's theorem. You sort of know this is going to happen, and um, the big question that sort of was open, I think, was was what can we say, if anything, about the existence and uniqueness of fixed points for these deck models. And in general, this seems very hard to do. Um, but fortunately, there actually is a very nice sort of framework that lets us, that lets us analyze and answer these kind of questions. Um, and the framework we're going to use is, is that of, of monotone operator theory. So this is a sort of a beautiful kind of, kind of uh, framework that actually uh, is behind a lot of methods in convex optimization, or if you rather you can use it to prove a lot of things about convex optimization. Um, a lot of algorithms like proximal methods, um, uh, ADMM, similar ones can be derived from monotone operator theory. And there's sort of actually even some related work by some of the people in monotone operator theory about, about deep learning. Um, but the, the, and actually, I'm not going to get into all the details here. It's, it's, it's in our paper that I, I, I encourage everyone to check out. Um, um, I also encourage people to sort of look at these. So, so, so of course, like the, the big tomb on, uh, on monotone operator theory is, is, is Bashke and, 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 and Combet. Uh, but if you want a shorter version, actually, uh, Ernest Ryu and Stephen Boyd wrote a really nice like 50 page primer on operating methods. Very, very readable. I'd really recommend checking this one out. Um, the key idea, uh, actually, I'm just going to state, I'm not going to prove here, I'm just going to state, um, is, is the following. So if we consider a single layer deck like this, so, the, so think about the, the, the fixed point being, you know, some nonlinearity applied to a linear operator of that same fixed point plus an input injection term. Then with monotone operator theory, you can actually can prove the following result. The result is that um, there exists a unique fixed point of the system, provided that, and these are, uh, sufficient, not necessary conditions. So, so these are sufficient conditions. Um, you can have a fixed unique fixed point, even if it doesn't happen, but if once you prove there's a unique fixed point. First of all, that there's a certain positive definiteness condition on the weight. So in particular, that the W plus W transpose has to be less than uh, two times the identity in the positive definite sense. And the nonlinearity has to be given by the proximal, the proximal operator of some convex function F. But if these two things are satisfied, that there is a unique fixed point of this system. And in fact, not only that, we can also can actually compute what this fixed point is using uh, what are called monotone operator splitting methods. And we'll mention that uh, more in a second. Now, a couple of things to mention. Uh, and basically, the, 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 the result is actually quite straightforward once you establish all the theory, all, all sort of like the, the, the basic properties of monotone operator theory. But the basic, the, the basic idea here is that this result comes from the fact that the fixed point of the system can just be viewed as the solution of a specific monotone operator splitting problem, uh, which is a whole class of methods that underlie things like ADMM and stuff like that. Um, but this is, this is the basic idea here. And um, one thing to point out is that actually, this can be true even if this just applying this fixed point iteration is unstable. So it actually can be the case that, that W has very large operator norms. So it's not a sort of a stable system in and of itself, as long as it's sort of, sort of large in the negative eigenvalue direction. But it can have very large operator norm. Uh, it just needs to be, it, it just, it just uh, needs to have this property here. And then there is still a unique fixed point, even if normal forward iteration won't find it, though other forward iterations can find it. 
Um, someone's okay. Uh, this is a long question, so maybe I'll I'll address the next one uh, afterwards <laughs> uh, rather than read it right now. Uh, so I have five minutes left, so I think I'll get through this last bit in a in a pretty short time frame. So. The question, of course, is that are these reasonable assumptions? Can we actually assume that we have this? I mean, I don't know if that's going to hold or not. Um, and is the is the long linear really a proximal operator? Is that is that true or not? Um, the second one actually is not a problem. Second one is is typically true. Um, in fact, this paper um, also by the you know by the Monson operator theory guys uh, shows that actually, as well as some other paper by by by, by uh, other authors as well, shows that basically um, most nonlinearities we actually use in practice can be approximated or exactly in some sense specified by um, as, as proximal operators. So, for example, the rel u is a proximal operator of the indicator of the positive orthant, right? It's just a projection, which was just the projection onto the positive orthant. Um, so that was actually no problem. The first one, or the second one, I guess, uh, they are prox operators. The, the other question though, is it, is it realistic to assume this positive definiteness condition? And here the answer is no. Um, if I train a normal network, even if even actually this is actually true at initialization, it's, it's true there kind of interestingly from, from random matrix theory, but um, after you start optimizing W, it will not be true pretty quickly. You will pretty quickly violate this monotone condition. And so the trick of our approach then is actually to parameterize W in a way that enforces this condition by default. In particular, we parameterize W as um, negative F transpose F for some other linear operator F plus G plus minus G trans, uh, plus G transpose minus G. And the idea here is you're actually decomposing W into a negative definite component and a anti-symmetric component that together will satisfy this constraint always. And actually they'll, they'll even satisfy it uh, up to some additional constant, uh, uh, strong monoticity constant M. And so this is the key point here is you actually, even though this condition does not typically hold, you can parameterize W in a way that it actually does hold. Um, is always contractive. So the forward iteration is not contractive, but you can design uh, operator splitting methods that are always contractive, yes. Um, so, so again, so this operation will not be contractive. It actually will sometimes be, be an expansion, but you can always design a, a damped version that is contractive and or a different fixed point iteration that will converge this solution here. And the details of that are in the paper. Okay, so the advantages, as I say, of this are, are sort of twofold. So the first one is that you know we can know there's a fixed point. The second one, which I mentioned before, is that uh, because they uh, have, because um, we we sort of have these monotone properties, we can apply operator splitting approaches, and this go by the names of things like forward backward iteration, piecemeal rackford iteration, Douglas rackford iteration, etc., uh, to find this fixed point. And many of these methods actually converge much much faster. Uh, we, they have linear convergence and they converge much, much faster in practice than just simple forward iteration. So it actually gives us a whole wealth of algorithms to apply to find these fixed points very efficiently. The last thing, which is kind of a cool uh, sort of <clears throat> aside from all this, is that the backwards pass also in, in this particular form can be written as an operator splitting method. So, it's, so, so actually you can simplify that backwards pass formulation and write it as a separate, actually linear, uh, operator splitting problem, and you also use these same methods to derive an efficient backwards pass as well. So we sort of have both efficient forward and backwards passes here. Um, just to highlight this working, we, we actually uh, the, uh, use a sort of a, uh, or employ this to solve sort of simple um, multi-scale but still monotone operator formulation, where in this case, um, Oops, it's sort of a little bit off my arrows here, but uh, basically the, 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 we, we, we use a structured matrix W where the diagonal entries here were square convolutions and the off diagonal entries here were downsampling convolutions. So it's like more like a traditional kind of downsampling version of a network. Um, we use similar tricks to, uh, to compute the, to, 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 as I mentioned before, to ensure that this whole thing is PSD or that this really I minus W is PSD. And we also actually, for the other methods, need to compute the inverse of these things or the inverse of I plus W actually. And to do that, we, we uh, end up, um, and to do that, we end up uh, basically uh, using an FFT to compute the inverse efficiently. And we use the piecemeal rackford uh, fixed point iteration to converge. Um, and again, uh, so, so 
were these, these methods, I should also be, be frank here, they do not yet scale to the size of the more um, heuristic decks that we have. So we're still talking about CIFAR here, just to the nature of these four iteration algorithms and the nature of sort of the inverse we have to compute here, make it a little bit slower. Um, but for reasonable size networks that are still smaller than our other ones, but still reasonable size, we're able to get good performance on CIFAR. Um, again, sort of outperforming all the implicit methods that, that do have this property of guaranteed fixed points, even if they are not yet at sort of the level of the, of the you know, theoretically unjustified methods I showed before. Um, uh, Shai, I'll mention your point actually in a second, because we do, we have actually some really cool, uh, so maybe I'll just mention this here. We, this, is, this is actually in a follow-up paper we have, but the one thing you can easily show about these monotone uh, operators is that their Lipschitz constant is bounded um, exactly by one over M. So M is a strong monotonicity parameter. Uh, it basically says like how, how it's, it's sort of like a strong convexity parameter, the, the it's the, it's the equivalent of a strong convexity parameter. And one over M governs exactly a bound on the Lipschitz constant of this fixed point iteration layer, which provides a very nice way of doing capacity control for the complexity of this, of this function. Yeah. And you can't control generalization exactly, but we do have some nice bounds also that you can then show a generalization bounds from that Lipschitz sort of constant bound. Um, okay, so with that, I am a minute over, but essentially done. Uh, so. The, the pilot, the, you know, again, the, the, the big points I want to highlight here are, are the three sections I, I mentioned, right, which is first, introducing this framework of deep equilibrium models, uh, showing that it scales both on large scale NLP, but also on large scale kind of uh, modern computer vision tasks to getting at least close to state of the art and ones that haven't, you know, in, in some of these tasks, even though, frankly, they've been kind of um, uh, beaten to death with a lot of these, these previous deep learning approaches. Um, and then finally, I'll, I almost want to highlight that, that, that even though we are not quite there at bring, bridging the gap between theory and practice of these things, uh, given there is still a big gap between sort of the performance of monotone decks and, and decks overall, um, we are getting close to understanding kind of the, 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 the nature of these things, understanding their fixed point characterization and doing things like this. And so hopefully I have uh, convinced you through all this, there's at least many different ways of thinking about depth and deep networks. And maybe we actually can, can sort of move from our current obsession with big, enormous computation graphs to a notion of shallow but implicit and structured learning to solve problems that are just as big as our current uh, challenges that we solve with deep learning. And the paper and code are all available on my, on my website. Okay, so thanks, thanks very much everyone. I'll start getting to questions now, but I'll let David speak first. Oh, I was just going to say, thank you very much, Diego. I learned a lot. Um, yeah, and we have about uh, 15 minutes for questions. So I guess you right, have so them let here. Me go through the, let me go through the ones first in the, in the chat. There's, there's one big one, um, uh, <laughs> Moshtaba. I'm sorry that I, that I skipped over years. I couldn't read that quickly and, and also continue my talk. So I'll, I'll go through it now. So um, it seems to me in the end, our goal is to conceptualize things, which means maybe it's a better idea to have multiple functions instead of one that represents complex ideas. For example, in text generation, Function of grammar, one percentment, and so on. Yeah. So, okay. Um, what I would say is there is plenty of room to embed structure and intentional structure into decks themselves. So, just I mean, that's in sometimes what the multiscale deck was. It was a way of embedding structure into a deck because we know we sort of want to have. I shouldn't skip through these. We know we kind of want to have um, some high resolution feature descriptors, some low resolution ones. And so all that structure, and, and, and for whatever structure you sort of want, I can build an equivalent version that sort of is embedded in one layer. The structure that this gets rid of is this notion of, you know, how many layers do you pick? Do you pick 20 layers? Do you pick 15 layers? Do you contract the channel size as you go in layers? Like when do you step down resolution? All of those questions, I think, are irrelevant, personally. Um, I think those are sort of hacks that have come about because in deep learning, it has been the principle to combine computation with architecture. So our architectures are always kind of computationally prescriptive. We describe how to compute them as well as like what they do. And so absolutely, embed structure in this one function. 
definitely do that. So have, you know, a decoder portion, an encoder portion, and, and you know, have these, have the decoder only be able to see the, you know, a, a bottleneck, which, go, which goes through the, the, the encoder. Um, so the, the decoder only sees stuff that goes through a, the, 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 a bottleneck for, for, the, for, for the encoder. Um, embed all that structure that you want there, but do it as sort of a, a, a fixed point condition instead of as an explicitly unrolled computational graph. And that gives you much, I would say, better control over the structure where you can separate that from the, you know, the random computation of, of how many layers you have before you, 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 you go to your decoder and stuff like this. Um, now to be clear, there are still some architectural choices here, right? So I mean, we're still using residual blocks, for example, in this very picture. So we're, we're not actually debating it entirely. There's some structure here, but I think it's a much more elegant structure to be, to be honest, I'm, 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 I'm admittedly biased in all this, but I think it's a more elegant structure than our current approaches to structure in deep learning. Um, and in fact, you, and you saw that in, in the next slides too. So, so this, this, this other one here, um, you know, this used a, a, st a structured W matrix in order to sort of enforce the fact that we can downsample to one scale um, or uh, convolve to the same scale, right? It's sort of what this structure of the matrix implies here. So there's lots of structures that, that you can enforce in DEX. Um, I just think it's nicer structure than, than the structure we have in normal deep networks. Though, of course, I'm, I am admittedly quite, quite biased in this regard. Uh, OK, so someone says, I'm curious about whether DEC models can do adaptive computation or tasks that require different comp compute budgets. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we haven't done much of this yet, to be clear. Um, but I think the answer is yes. So the answer, the reason why I think the answer is yes, is that one nice thing you have about DEX is that because you separate out the process of computing a fixed point from the process of like, you know, the objective, which is to find the fixed point, what can happen is that in certain situations where the computation is say easier, is you may converge to the fixed point faster, or really you may converge to a certain tolerance level faster, and you can be done with computation there. So in some sense, what you can what you can often do when you have you know an easy problem is that you will find, hopefully, we haven't done a lot of this, but I think this is this is sort of what I what I hope will happen, is that you'll find that you actually can find these fixed points more easily and so use less computation to compute them. Um, now I know there are, and you may even be able to have some sort of like early exit where you, you know, look at how the loss function is evolving with the different iterations and sort of you know quit early or quit with a low tolerance if you're good enough in terms of your final prediction and stuff like that. We haven't done a lot of that yet, but I think it's very possible. Um, it's a cool direction and idea, um, but we haven't done it yet, but I think it is amenable to it. I think it's actually more amenable to it again, because I think that you know we're specifying here an objective. Uh, we want to find a fixed point or, or in more, you know, for other, implicit layers, there's other objectives. Like you want to solve an optimization problem or you want to compute, uh, like in David's stuff, the solution of some differential equation. Uh, and so there's a lot of opportunities actually for adaptive computation, I think more than in traditional networks where they're sort of like these thresholds you have to sort of enforce kind of a priori, right? Where if things are looking good initially, you go on to, the, to one unit, otherwise you do the other. I think there's a lot of opportunities for these in these implicit models, yes. Um, okay. Uh, any other questions? Shai, did I sufficiently answer your question with the Lipschitz constant stuff? That's all we know so far about- I mean, Give me a hint on the direction, right? Okay, yeah. Um, that's all I know about so far. Um, I don't know, for example, how to impose like local Lipschitz constants. We thought us a lot because I, I thought about you know I also work a lot in robustness. I thought a lot about sort of if you could uh, estimate things like local Lipschitz constants. We have not yet succeeded at that, but you can estimate global Lipschitz constants kind of almost trivially uh, through the strong monotonicity parameter, which is which is very nice. Um, there's actually another and, and there's another paper that kind of came out simultaneous to ours about doing that uh, for non, for other, for, 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 for more general class of monotonicity operators that operate on other norms, not just the L2 norm. And so there's actually a lot of things you can do to enforce structure like that. Yeah. Uh, and control, control the capacity like that. Thanks. Um, 
Do you have any examples of how to create adversarial examples on MDEX? So um, from a standpoint, I mean, so, so from, a, from a conceptual standpoint, A, they still have adversarial examples. To be clear, like we're not fixing anything like that. So this is, this is separate from my other work on adversarial robustness. These things are just as adversarial and non-robust as any other model. Um, but conceptually, it's exactly the same. So because these layers are differentiable, right? Because you can differentiate through these fixed point layers, you can also differentiate with the input into the fixed point layer. Um, and then find an ever so example by gradient based methods just the way you would anyway. So you can use the, all the exact same techniques um, to compute adversarial examples as you do in normal for normal deep networks. And they still exist in the exact same way as for normal networks. There's no, uh, nothing is saved at all. <laughs> uh, you, you get no benefit really from these things there. So, so we have thought a little bit about whether they're through this capacity control and stuff like that, whether there are ways to, to easily train adversarially robust uh, deck models, but so far we have not done any better than adversarial training. So when we wanna make them robust, we just do adversarial training and it, and it works uh, you know, the same as for a normal deep network. And just like normal deep networks, you lose a whole lot of uh, um, uh, clean accuracy when you train them to be robust. So some people are asking about if there's a recording available. I'm asking the organizers if they can post a link or something like that. Yeah, it's being recorded. So I, I, I believe it is. And certainly I'm happy to have all it, all it recorded. So definitely, hopefully there is. I was going to post a link. Okay, thank you. Zeke, I have a question, which is, yeah. so <clears throat> this monoton, monotonicity, monotonicity uh, guarantees yeah. stability. But I guess I want to ask about the, the gap between theory and practice. Like if yeah. you. If I was going to apply this somewhere, would you say I should just start with the regular sort of unrestricted deck and see how yeah, it goes? Probably. <laughs> okay. So, so the thing with the regular deck is that there are some tricks you need to do to make it work, as there are with all things that are not they have no guarantees. Um, so, one thing we find, uh, and and to be honest, like these tricks exist right now in Xiaoji's code, uh, and they will are soon to exist in in our forthcoming uh, tutorial that that we are also writing up. So. There are tricks like like when you have a normal layer that like like a residual layer, you have to apply normalization in the right places to ensure that these things actually converge well. You can pretty easily create a layer that does not have fixed points. Um, that is 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 you know very non very uh, uh, expansive, right? Uh, not non expansive, I will say, and, uh, and and will not have good fixed points. So you sort of liberally apply things like group norm uh, or other normalizations along the way. Um, another big trick to this is that you you almost always want to normalize inputs the input before you apply the fixed point iteration um, because for example if the input to the, to the fixed point iteration is very small then it's almost as if there is no input and it, it, it sometimes it's a hard time finding a fixed point which was like like especially if you have normalization that sort of then up normalizes it it, it, it it all becomes very strange when you do that so um, there are tricks to it so basically before we usually apply a a layer, we take our input injection, but then apply batch norm to that thing uh, before we add it to the other thing because uh, otherwise it isn't very well conditioned. Like, like the, the two scales of the of the Z's and the input injection can be on very different scales and that makes it harder to find a fixed point. So there are tricks. Monotone decks kind of kind of make it easy in that, you know, by the way, like one thing that happens here, right, is that this 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 theorem here is true regardless of the U or the B operator, like, like the U matrix or the B. So for any input, doesn't matter what it is, this fixed point will exist. Um, and actually even doesn't, for even the, the convergence, of, so the monotone operator splitting, their convergence really only depends on W, not really on, on the input. So it's really nice in that they have this beautiful property that it doesn't really matter how you how you train them to a certain extent, like or how you embed them in, in, in other layers, they will just work. But um, in terms of pure speed of these networks and the size you can scale to, uh, the heuristic ones still work a little better right now. So I can't quite fully recommend this until we can sort of make them um, as as uh, yeah as easy to use, I guess, as as other ones. And and to be honest, like when you when you start doing like convolutional operators in forms like this, like a com transpose follows by a convolution, like that has a weird scaling too. You have to apply like weight norm to do that, so it can be. There's weird things in that too, uh, but but it can be it can work out nicely. You just have to do like in both cases there are little there there are some tricks that again is embedded in the code that we have. <laughs>